Hello everyone and welcome to the Fine Arts Missouri Educators Session for February 6th, 2024. We are joined today by Clint Velasquez. And Clint, if you don't mind, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, give a little background about who you are and what you are bringing to us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Clint Velasquez. I am the founder and executive director of Bass Academy of Music in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Bass Academy of Music is a nonprofit music school whose mission is to make music education accessible and affordable for all students across Kansas City. Uh, we do that primarily by offering uh, sliding scale music lessons one-on-one uh, -on -one to over 200 young people in the Kansas City metro area with over 20 teachers. Uh, the majority of our students are um, a racial minority and uh, come from a free reduced lunch background. So um, we really focus on making sure that those who might not otherwise have access do have access. Uh, I've been an educator now for 20 years. Um, I come from a family of educators. My father was a choir director his whole life. My grandmother was the band, choir, English, and history teacher at her small town in Kansas. Um, so I have a lot of, lot of respect um, for educators and for the arts and what, uh, what arts can do for young people and all of us. Thank you so much, Clint. So if you are ready, we are ready for you. Um, yeah, I am ready to go. So um, as I said, at ba uh, Bass Academy of Music, uh, we teach one-on-one -on -one music lessons, one-on-one uh, -on -one music lessons. I started teaching in college when I was studying musical theater, uh, playing guitar, and um, walked into a guitar store and some guy said, oh, you should teach. And I said, I'm not that good. And he said, well, neither are beginners. And that changed my life. Um, I started teaching and discovered I really enjoyed it. Um, and through that teaching, though, um, as I continued, um, I learned that I, I would teach in a small room and have all these amazing musicians all around me and um, hear these amazing things kind of through the walls, but never really talk and collaborate, would come into the room, teach and then leave. Um, and I didn't particularly love that. Uh, so when Bass Academy of Music was founded, to bring music access to young people in Kansas City because there's just a severe lack of access in our area. I knew that there were some things that needed to change. Um, around that time, I had read Daniel Coyle's book, The Talent Code, uh, where he had talked about talent hotbeds, places around the world where there was just a disproportionate number of talented individuals coming up, Houston, Texas, and singers, the favelas in Brazil, and the number of soccer players. Um, the number of professional baseball players that all come from the same small town in the Dominican Republic. Um, there's just places around the world where there are just crazy amounts of talent. And this uh, author was very curious as to why that was happening. Um, as he went around and studied, he saw that um, there were three principles that he found at every single one of those um, talent hotbeds, as he coined them. Um, there was a culture of ignition um, the students there wanted to learn. They were excited about what was going on. Um, there was a dedication to deep practice, to a really understanding of there's ways that we can do things that help us learn and grow skills better than others. And there's just a commitment in those cultures to developing deep practice. And each culture was led by what he called a master coach someone who had just had a deep understanding to walk into a situation and be a talent whisperer see a student who was working on something and he, they would say raise your elbow and boom home run or relax into that high note and suddenly the sound came out beautiful and clear um, the ability to just kind of walk in see the next step that needed to happen with that student's journey and was able to deliver it in a small quick concise way um, and based on those three principles, that is how we operate as an organization at Base Academy of Music. Um, we're focused on creating a, a, a culture of ignition that gets students excited about making music. We're really interested in teaching our students best practices for their individual development. So that way, as they go on, they learn the most. Um, but what you know as an educator, um, you can try to get kids excited. You can tell them to practice all that you want. Um, 
but really the only thing that we have a lot of control over is what we do as educators. Um, and so master coaching, this is, this is this concept from this book um, and this kind of what it looks like for us at Bass Academy of Music to put this into practice. Um, going back to my original teaching experiences, I was having, you know, hearing all these amazing teachers and never actually hearing what they did, um, you know, never sharing stories and such. And I realized what we need as teachers um, is we need really big toolboxes. We need to be able to walk into a situation with a student and say, oh, this is what's going on. This is how I can help you move forward. Uh, this is what's going on for you. This is how I can help you move forward. Uh, I was coaching a teacher the other day um, through rhythm and um, just over and over and over and over again, he was trying to get the student to play this piece. And he's like, play with the metronome, try to match me going on. And I was just watching, you know, the students kind of eyes glaze over every time got instructions, got instructions and went on. Um, and I suggested to him, I said, ask the student to play the note at the same time that she hears the click. And he did. And like, you could just see kind of something in her eyes just pop open. And she's like, oh, um, it was a moment where he just needed a little bit bigger of a toolbox to say, how do you help a student who's not getting it get that? I think that um, the way to get the big toolbox is to constantly be learning, to constantly share um, when you're doing professional development, where are the opportunities as educators where they can, where we can all just bring our ideas, bring our problems, bring our questions to a room of other educators who have been doing this and hear, hey, I have a student who is struggling with this. Has anybody else had a student that's struggling with this? And what's amazing is educators probably have. Someone else in the room has probably seen something and they're like, oh yeah, I remember this one time this was going on and this is what I did to help with that. Um, so we constantly are trying to get our teachers together out of their lessons and have them time to share where they can actually say, this is going on, how do I do this? Our violin teachers are giving insights that our drum teachers are taking back into their classroom and applying. Our voice teachers are hearing tricks from the guitar teacher and helping their students open up their diaphragms more. Um, what I continue to find is um, those, those opportunities to learn and grow as an, as an educator happen when you are very conscious about saying, I need every trick I can possibly get because any situation is going to come up and I want to be ready for it. And the best way to be ready for it is that to constantly be a learner. Um, and so for us at Base Academy of Music to be master coaches, we have to be dedicated to that. And so we just try to create as many opportunities as possible um, to have the bigger toolbox. Hey, Clint, can you tell us a little bit about some of the structures you have in place at Base that allow for that collaboration? Because as oh, yeah. I listen to you, one of the challenges that often happens in public school instruction too, everyone's in isolation and the mm -hmm. opportunities for uh, common time are during a meal maybe, and maybe you're surrounded by other people who are non-arts teachers. And that time that's really dedicated to that kind of collaboration is few and far between. How do you uh, set that up at base? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, that is a really, that is a really good question and a really big struggle. Um, it's like, when do you do that? And in some ways, we have different kind of struggle. Uh, all of our teachers are contract employees. The majority of them are professional gigging musicians here in Kansas City. Um, so they come in, they teach and they leave. Um, what we do for all of our lessons is we have our teachers do lesson notes. So um, it's the short, sweet a little bit of information that they do for every single lesson. We use SOAP notes, which are a psychology-based note, um, measuring subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. Um, subjective, how was the student when they came in? Objective, what did we do? Um, assessment, what's um, assessment? How did they how did they receive that instruction? Kind of what was, what was their response to it? Plan, what are we gonna do next week? Um, 
when you do that every week, you have your teachers who are constantly having to reflect on what they've done. Um, and then there's also a written, uh, there's also a written record for us as administrators to, you know, quickly glance, be able to read through um, what's going on so we can find common trends, common issues, common problems. Um, from there, um, being really intentional about um, quick questions to your teachers um, is, a, is a big piece. We're coming through the hallways, a two minute check-in can lead to a lot, can give you a lot of information. And I think that that can't be underestimated. You don't need tons of time to find out little pieces of information that can be really helpful. Um, but the final piece is there is a lot of, there is time dedicated for education to professional development. And I think that when, when administrators are planning their professional development, that professional development is probably best served led by the teachers. Um, have, give them adequate time for that connection, for those conversations. There is so much that is putting, being put out as far as you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. If you wanna be successful as an educator, if you want to be successful as an administrator, you have to carve out the culture. You have to carve out the time to build the culture of learning amongst your teachers. Um, and that investment will pay so many fold in their performance and the students' success. I, well, I was struck by this the very first time we met. But also, again, as I hear you say it again, my husband was trained as a massage therapist. And it's the first time I came across that that practice of soap notes and it was to guide their next time that they're going to work with that client and it's just such a perfect avenue for not only as you said administrative record keeping and you know a, a, a catalyst for conversation and collaboration with others as well as oh yeah what did they do last time they did measures three to 18 we're going to revisit three to 18 but we're going to focus on measures 30 to 45 or whatever it happened to be so as a musician they say the best time to practice is right after your lesson maybe one of the best times to improve your teaching is right after you've taught just write about what you did absolutely um, maggie you had a question uh i belong to the music educators association and it's a professional organization for music educators very very helpful even though i am a visual art educator uh, this this is where you pick up all those uh, arts integration tips. And there is this program that they do all the time. And Phyllis, do, do you belong to the Music Educators Association? I okay. do. I'm a member. They, sure. And they call it Amplify. And uh, Amplify happens in classrooms all around the the United States and uh, music educators, they tap into uh, what, where they need help. It can be a beginning music teacher, mid-level or even a veteran. And they, they talk about uh, how do you teach a trumpeter to uh, shape their lips when they're wearing braces? How, uh, I mean, the, they're they're very very they come to the point they're uh and just like they're they're very quick uh they're easy probably ha this happens i'm sure all over anybody who's teaching brass or band or or anything like this um how do you teach uh special needs st students with uh hearing impairment uh, they're 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 very direct, and uh, uh, they get many many different answers that can be applied to your teaching situation. But check into Amplify. I I do it all the time. Even though I'm a, an art teacher, I want to know how they solve these these uh, very specific questions. Are you familiar yeah. with Amplify? Phyllis. Yes, Maggie. And I I think it just underscores one of the tenets that Clint mentioned earlier, the, the power that 
lies in collaboration and mm -hmm. community problem solving, both as a vehicle for solving a problem and helping a student, but also as adding to your personal toolbox. It, it is, it is. And uh, you, you know, education changes, your teaching clientele changes. You need a, a very diverse toolbox and, and uh, you'll never know when the student's going to walk into your music room with this particular need. So you, uh, you, you need this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I think like that, this is gonna like leads actually well into my second point of, um, you know, so having the big toolbox, um, but also being really aware of your needs and your staff needs. Um, it means as an administrator, you have to make sure that you're constantly checking in, you're visiting, you're communicating. Um, as, as a teacher, you're stepping back and you're kind of looking at issues that are happening and being really, um, really practical about what is going on here. Um, one thing that, you know, we, we deal with music educators a lot, the question that comes up all of the time is, why aren't my students practicing? Um, and that, like, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the best questions that, you know, that you just you know, hear over and over and over again. And um, it's a legitimate need of like, how do you get kids to actually do the things that we're teaching them at home so that way there's some improvement. Um, and, you know, when, when we have those conversations and I'm, you know, reading teacher's notes and I'm saying they're not practicing, they're not practicing, they're not practicing. Unfortunately, I come to the teacher and I say, what are you showing them? What are you doing? Like, because the need actually here isn't necessarily that the kid needs to practice. It's that something needs to change with the teacher and how they're delivering. Um, or it could be, what, what is the kid's situation at home? Do they never practice because the piano is right across from the TV and it's on for 12 hours a day at their house? So they can't. Um, we had uh, an issue for a while of, um, we were doing our music lessons inside a school and um, the students just were unfocused and not really paying much attention um, for quite a while. And the teachers are just talking about having all kinds of behavioral issues. Um, and we were hearing this from multiple different teachers in multiple areas. And after talking with the kids, observing and everything, we realized if we got some granola bars and gave the kid a granola bar right before they went into their lesson, all of the behavioral issues went away. Kids just needed some, needed some sugar after a long day of learning, their brains were tired. Um, there's, there's things that like, uh, you know, as teachers, we should be aware of like, yes, we need the big toolbox. Um, we should be aware of like, man, this would be so helpful if I had blank um, for my teaching. As administrators, we can co come and say like, what would be really, really helpful? Um, so being really hyper aware of your needs and your staff's needs, knowing that um, while there are needs that should definitely be met, and I'm a big supporter of advocating for um, teachers to be fairly compensated and more fairly compensated than they are right now, um, that would just take care of a lot of needs for those teachers, help them focus more in the classroom. Um, if any, any lobbyists, any, uh, <laughs> any people who have anything to do with the budget on paying teachers, um, pay them more. They're worth it. They're definitely worth it. Um, but take care of the little needs. And in a lot of ways, the needs are more simple than you think. Um, listening to your teachers and finding out, wow, it'd be wonderful if they had some books or some pencils, um, maybe the whiteboard eraser the whiteboard just isn't being cleaned and they can't use that as an example, small things that can make the teaching experience so much better. Um, if you take the time to just really listen and watch and find out is the stated need, the real need or is the stated need kind of the squeaky wheel that you need to follow to find out what's going on. Um, yeah. So that makes sense. There's so many times that, 
uh, something that is an easily met need is lying underneath what is the perceived need. And uh, listening is great for an administrator, just as listening is great for a teacher to kind of hear and listen through to understand what the core issues might be with the student. Mm -hmm. I love the example you gave of well, they're not practicing because the television's on and it can't be off for whatever reason in their home. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, there's there's extenuating circumstances in each kid's life. And um, we as educators, um, you know, it's like there's going to be a difficulty. And so can we give them, going back to our toolbox, if we've been paying attention to going to the knees, can we help them figure out a tool that they can use to deal with their circumstances so that they can continue to grow? Um, we can be creative about it, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing. I think I told one kid that he has to put his guitar right next to the door so that, you know, whenever he goes to brush his teeth at the end of the night, he's going to see his guitar and then sit down and play some songs and then he goes and brushes his teeth. Um, just little things that will motivate them to be like, oh yeah, this, I like this thing. Um, maybe... I just need to see the thing to remember I like the thing and I want to do the thing. Um, we can really help our students. We can help our staff overcome a lot of problems by just asking some really good questions. Um, and then moving on, I think um, the, the final piece here is um, we need to, as educators, um, be really aware of our areas of needed growth um, and weakness, especially. Um, this is one I think that can be, um, we talk about this uh, both to the young educators and uh, to the seasoned educators, um, that our areas, of, um, our areas of weakness, our areas of growth um, can be sometimes a little hard to, note, hard to, hard to see or not, not as prevalent. Um, I interviewed a young teacher who was very, very confident in her abilities and that always, always makes me laugh. Um, cause I'm like, oh, you, you're going to get very frustrated very quickly when the students don't listen to you. Like you think they should, <laughs> when the things are not going your way. Um, I, uh, and it's like, I love the energy, but I always want them to know, um, Hey, come into it wide, eyes wide open. You are a brand new teacher. Um, we all know the professional musician or we all know the professional who is just great at their craft and a terrible instructor. <laughs> um, there's just a limit to what their mastery has actually taught them. They, they, they know very, very well how to be a great performer. They don't know how to be a good teacher. Um, I think for us, as we, as educators, as um, as those pursuing mastery in a in a skill set, um, one of the things that we need to realize is our mastery comes at a cost. Um, as you become a better educator, especially as you become like more heightened in a specific area, you're learning more and more and more and more. And kind of what that means, though, is that you're transfer. Like we get very confident in our transferable knowledge. Um, that I am an amazing one-on-one -on -one instructor probably wouldn't put me in front of an orchestra. It's just a very different skill set and that transferable knowledge, I, I don't have that skill set to go stand in front of an orchestra and conduct that at the level of a master orchestra conductor. Um, they have mastery that I don't and I, and I would be stepping way outside of my zone um, as, as a teacher thinking that, oh, well, because I'm a fantastic music teacher, I can obviously do this thing that's music adjacent or this thing that's music adjacent. Um, very often we, we can find those things. I met recently an amazing teacher who, um, just watching him work with students, it was just, it was really incredible just seeing what he could do. Um, but then we had a young teacher come in to learn and work with him. And I just learned very quickly, um, this incredible teacher was not actually a great coach for young teachers. Um, just didn't have a lot of patience or time for someone who wasn't ready to step in and learn the ropes. Um, 
but he thought he was. And I think that that's uh, just something for us to always be aware of. Um, I, I wrote this down. I was like, I, uh, I intend to be the best educator that I possibly can be for my students um, and for the best administrator that I can possibly be for my team, because that I think that the families that we serve deserve that from me. Um, and I have that expectation for all of the teachers that we have at BAM, that we should be the best that we possibly can be. Uh, and I just want all of our teachers to always be very aware of um, what that means to to know where they need to grow. What's not great? What is um, what can be really improved upon? I know um, as artists in all disciplines, we're super hypercritical of ourselves in ways that are just sometimes very unfair. You've you've done amazing work, and you should be kind to yourself. Um, but perhaps as educators, we might not apply that same criticism to ourselves. <laughs> and perhaps as educators, we could take a harder look and say, what skill set would it be really good to actually improve upon? Um, and as we continue to improve our skills, um, be really, really aware of what skills we have and what skills that we can speak with authority on and what skills don't transfer. And um, we actually need to step back and say, I know how to get really good at teaching this. Um, let me do like Maggie does here. <laughs> I'm just, like when you mentioned what, being part of MEA, I'm just, I'm amazed because you're, you're doing the exact same thing. Like, you know, as a fine artist, you have an amazing skill set to teach and you're constantly seeking to add to that toolbox. What is missing? What's missing in this inventory? What's missing here? How can I learn? Um, who is doing this thing here? Because I want to raise the whole level of my teaching because um, it just makes both you as an educator and every person that you come across a better, a better practitioner um, because you've spent that time for it. So that, that's what yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you I was going to say, that is what we, that, that is what master coaching looks like for us at Base Academy of Music. It's a, it's a dedication to having the biggest toolbox we possibly can as instructors. It's a dedication for us as instructors to be um, aware of our needs um, and being able to speak those and name those as administrators. And it's an awareness of our weaknesses and growth and areas of needing to be growth. So that way we can be the best we possibly can be for those we serve. Inspiring. And it's also making me make a connection with some of the work of my colleague, Dr. Cynthia Williams Phelps, who is also involved with the Alliance. She speaks about the value of reflective practice to be comfortable with the vulnerability of acknowledging what your strengths are and what the limitations within those strengths are, and then what your, what your areas of growth are to identify those as well. Um, when you and I were together, you, you had a book, a small book that you were referencing for the oh, yeah. small questions for reflection. And um, I would love for you to share with our audience um, how you've utilized this, this, re this resource to mm. cultivate that culture of reflective practice, um, which is based in a very respectful place that for even the new teacher coming in with a strong skill performance set who may have skill deficits in coaching or mentoring or working one-on-one -on -one with students at, the, at their particular level, that, that those colleagues, you build a culture of mutual respect to say, it's okay for you to say, I shine. If you are really good at X, it should be okay to say, you know, this is my strength <laughs> and I want to share it, not this is my strength and I want to lord it over you in some way. I'd love for you to share that, how you cultivate that reflective practice, how you build that environment of respect and trust and uh, help guide people toward that culture of, of reflective practice. Absolutely. Uh, well, the book is The Little Book of Talent. Um, it is by the same author, Daniel Coyle, and he took um, lessons from his book, The Talent Code, and he just condensed them into um, little one-off nuggets. And so um, 
you know, here, tip number 20, practice alone. Um, and this kind of gives some reasons for doing that. Um, another one is visualize the wires in your brain getting faster. Um, his, his book was highly researched. Um, he spoke to uh, just uh, neuros, uh, like neurosurgeons and neurospecialists, psychologists, um, world-renowned coaches uh, all around the world and kind of just compiled all of their things. Uh, this is actually, we jokingly, but we're, we're serious about saying this is our teacher handbook. Every teacher that we hire, uh, we get one of these for them. Um, that's their welcome. Uh, we read them through. Uh, we read through a couple of sections together as part of the training. And then it's the basis and guidebook of what we do uh, for all of our teacher meetings. When we're talking about different aspects, uh, we're going to be referring back to the little book of talent. What about this? Um, and so it gives you a it gives you a place it gives you a reference um, for those new teachers. It's it starts with saying like we want to be a resource for your growth. Um, and I think a big thing of cultivating cultivating an environment where people feel both comfortable in sharing their strengths and comfortable in sharing their weaknesses is that you as the leader of that organization have to start with sharing your weaknesses and your failures. Um, there is no quicker way to develop trust uh, and of culture of vulnerability than starting that way as the leader. You are not seen as weak. Um, if you think you are, you need to really reassess why. Why do you think that? Um, the vulnerability actually shows that you can learn, that learning is embraced here. Um, and it shows other people that they're okay making mistakes we don't learn unless we make mistakes it has to be embraced um it's learning is on a neurological level is connecting the synapses in your brain from one place to the other and teaching those synapses this is the pathway that i want you to go and you build those pin those <laughs> those connections by doing it over and over and as the synapses do it over and over and over again, your brain coats those neural pathways with myelin, which lets the connections go faster. And so then you practice, they're going faster, they're going faster, you're reinforcing it. But you build that connection that first with the trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. If that's how our students learn, then that's how we have to learn too. And that's how we have to lead. Very humbly. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Clint. Um, are there any questions? Uh, Maggie, I see your hand raised. Thanks. You know, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about the school. Where it's, is it located in suburban or rural or uh, downtown Kansas City? Um, yeah, absolutely. Is it brick and mortar or is it virtual? Um, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. I, love, I have some pictures. I, I have some Ooh, pictures yeah. I can I can share. Hold on one second and let me see if I can pull these up. Give me a minute. Okay. Um, we are located in uh in downtown in uh, urban Kansas City. Oh yeah. This is at one of our recitals at our location at um Paseo Baptist Church, which is at 25th and Paseo in um, Paseo Baptist Church is actually one of the oldest African American churches in Kansas City. Um, and so we have a partnership with them and we do our lessons in person um, at their building. Uh, we also actually have a second location at um, an area south of there at, um, on 79th and Troost. And we do our lessons after school um, inside a school location. So that those are locationally, that is where that is where the lessons happen. Um, <laughs> Do you want me to play this little movie? Or it is your uh, is your audio set? I uh, we'll find out. Can you hear me? I think I heard it. I, oh, you might need to hit the share audio button. I'll I'll restart. Hold on. 
Um, yeah. So that's the that's the uh, the, the where we teach. There it is. Because I like music all the time. Because they make these sounds. It, it's built a community, like me personally playing the piano and like seeing all the other pianists and being here at BAM and all that, just being surrounded by a community of people who love music and love to make it and are talented and have like amazing skills. Because, because I like the sounds of high and low and medium of the sounds in each chord that I play. I think I just like the way it sounds. I think about like jazz sounds and how they could be cool on the piano. I like hearing piano. Because it's the best. Yeah, it's a uh, base academy music. We say that because um, the idea is found helping students build foundations in music. Um, <clears throat> we mean that for a few different a few different ways. One, we're actually really interested in helping students um, start to play an instrument. Uh, what I noticed about the Kansas City uh, education community was there's a lot of organizations that would take students that had some skill in an instrument. Um, and promote them. But what I didn't see was uh, hardly any inter any organizations that would help a student um, get some skill in an instrument. Um, we've just got we we discovered with a lot of conversations with the parents that for the most part, getting the instrument isn't always a hard piece. Um, families are able to do that. It's the um, it's the how to play part that is pretty difficult for our students. Um, we focus mainly on one on one uh, lessons because we find a lot of the students and a lot of the families that we work with, um, they don't ever really get uh, individual time uh, with an adult um, throughout their week, uh, either maybe it's a single mom with a few kids and she's working two jobs and so it's just really hard to find that you know one on one time with their connection, or what their schools. Um, Schools are not really built for a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with students, and then if they're going to after-school programs or running around. Um, those moments where the kids can just sit down with an adult um, are really, really minimal. And um, we found that that time is really, really beneficial to just stop for 30 minutes a week and say, hey, I see you, I hear you, you really matter, uh, and I believe that you can do something amazing. Um, that that alone just has a profound impact on a kid's life. Um, and so for us to uh, fight the fight the temptation for bigger numbers, bigger programming numbers, more efficiency with um, more efficiency on uh, lowering the cost so we can serve more families, but say, hey, we're really, really focused on impact. Um, and we've been surveying our students. And what we found is that um, our students have a really high belief in themselves. They have a really high belief in their teacher's care of them. Um, they have a really high belief in what they're capable of. And we think that's directly related to the time that we're willing to spend just one-on-one -on -one with them. Also, we have a foundational belief that um, if talent is just the synopsis connecting in our brain, that anybody can be talented. Anybody can be amazing. Uh, and we, we as teachers believe that about every one of our students, and we're not satisfied until each one of our students believes that about themselves. Well, thank you so mm -hmm. much for sharing your words of wisdom with us today and being part of Fine Arts Missouri Educators here at the Alliance. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming, and I hope you have a great evening.
We'll hope to see you at a future Fine Arts Missouri Educator Session.